Hello students, this next section starts on page 20 and I'm gonna to read to page 41, so here we go. Here's from Captain Lewis's journal. June the 12th, 1804. The past few evenings we have been serenaded by nightingales. Their song reminds me of my father. They were singing that morning so many years ago when my father came home on leave from the army and paid his final visit to us. I remember feeling so intimidated and shy, I could barely utter a word in his presence. He was more than a man. It was almost as if some God had entered our home. The two days he stayed with us were wonderful. And then he was off to his command. None of us could have imagined that on his way there, he and his horse would be swept away across the Ravana River. That his horse would drown and that father would return to us in a terrible condition drenched from the river and a downpour of cold rain. I remember mother stripping off his clothes, putting him into bed and making him drink hot herbal tea. Despite her efforts, he contracted pneumonia. I watched him shiver and sweat for two days. And when he passed from us, I learned that gods can die too. We have taken on a, we have taken on a man by the name of Pierre Dorian, a trader who has lived among the Yankton Sioux for many years. We were lucky to run across him. And then here is from um, the guys who are reading the captain's journal. If you ask me, Dorian was lucky to run across us, Coulter says, probably the luckiest day of his life. How else would an old reprobate, reprobate like him get to meet the president of the United States? The men were always talking about luck. It came in two versions, good and bad. After a time, I got a sense of what they meant by this word and began to recognize it myself. And the day Dorian arrived was a day of very good luck for me. I was on the trail of a buck, which took me up a tree-covered hillside. When I reached the small clearing on the top, I, re I stopped my pursuit, realizing the buck was traveling too fast for me to catch up with him. I had just lain down in the cool grass to catch my breath when I heard Private Cruzette call out from the river. Boats ahead! Cruzette was our one-eyed fiddle-playing boatman. He and Private Labiche were experienced river men who had traveled the Missouri before and were therefore assigned to permanent duty on the keelboat. One of them manned the stern paddle while the other hung over the, ba the bow, pushing logs out of the way with an iron-tipped pole and calling out what lay ahead. A day or two before, we had encountered two boats with French trappers in them making their way down the Missouri to sell their furs. They had run out of powder and food. The captains gave them some of ours, but these pirogues that Cruzat was hollering about had a different smell to them. The wind blew a scent up to me that made me drool. My paws moved beneath me like they had sprouted wings, and I flew, up, flew down the hill a hundred times faster than I had come up it. I burst through the trees, jumped a short bank, and landed on shore still running. The keelboat and pirogues were already tied up, and the men were milling about, taking advantage of this unscheduled stop to lick their wounds. I ran directly for the source of that beautiful smell, which was coming from one of the newly arrived canoes. Standing next to it was an old man, and I guess I gave him quite a start, because when he saw me, he reached for his rifle. Fortunately, before he could get a bead on me, Drulliard stopped him and explained that I was Captain Lewis's dog. Pierre Dorian nearly laughed his gray-bearded face off at the revelation and made a big fuss over me, never having seen a canine my size. He said he thought I was an angry black bear. When he finished scratching me all over, he reached into a bucket and gave me a handful of buffalo grease. It tasted even better than it smelled and I thought happily of the meals to come when we reached the buffalo's feeding grounds. Dorian and the captain spent several hours talking about what lay ahead with Drulliard translating their words. It turned out that Dorian had lived with the Yankton Sioux for nearly 20 years and had a Yankton Sioux wife and a son by her. Captain Lewis was delighted to hear this and asked if Dorian would accompany us up the river to talk to the Sioux. Part of our mission, Captain Lewis explained, is to make friendly contact with all the tribes we meet along the way. We want to set up trading posts, which cannot succeed unless there is an atmosphere of peace. To this end, we would like to send some of the Sioux chiefs to Washington to meet with President Jefferson. 
Dorian thought he could arrange this, but he warned the captains that the Yanktons were just one branch of the Sioux Nation, and that farther up the Missouri we were going to run into their cousins, the Teton Sioux. And they, gentlemen, are a very different breed from the Yanktons, Dorian explained. They are brigands and will stop you from going upriver, or at the very least charge you a heavy toll to pass safely. We don't want to make trouble, Captain Lewis said, but we are prepared to stop if trouble it need be. The captains took Dorian to the keelboat and gave him a demonstration of what they meant by this. Normally, I didn't like these loud displays. The ruckus hurt my ears and made me jump. But I struck, I stuck next to Dorian all through it, hoping he might give me another handful of that delicious buffalo grease. Okay, here's another vocabulary word. The word is ruckus, so I'm going to reread so that you'll be able to have a context clue. Normally, I didn't like these loud displays. The ruckus hurt my ears and made me jump, but I stuck next to Dorian all through it, hoping he might give me another handful of that delicious buffalo grease. The keelboat had a thing on it called a swivel gun which was a small cannon set on a stand that could be swung around in any direction. It could be loaded with a single lead ball weighing about a pound or with several handfuls of musket balls. To fire the cannon off, at, off, they lit a small candle called a taper, touched the flame to the charge, and boom! Branches blew off trees and every animal within five miles stopped what it was doing. The boat also had two guns on board called blunderbusses, which swung around and spit out noise and destruction of a smaller nature. The captains fired each of these guns in turn for Dorian, and when they finished, Captain Lewis brought out his pride and joy, a rifle called an air gun that whispered when it was fired. Air was pumped inside the rifle, and when it, he pulled the trigger, the ball came out with hardly a sound. The captain loved this marvelous gun. Those will certainly make an impression on them, Dorian admitted after the white smoke cleared but your guns will have little effect on 200 Teton warriors shooting arrows if they decide to take your goods away from you. They can notch their arrows faster than you can char charge your rifles. Do not underestimate any of the Indians you meet. Their ways are different from ours, but they are smart and they'll know that your guns and supplies would make them the most powerful tribe on the continent. The captains exchanged worried glances, but I didn't hear what they had to say about Dorian's warning because about that time, Cruzat broke out his fiddle and started making the squeaky noises that I liked less than the sound the swivel gun made. Though it meant partying from Dorian and his buffalo grease, I went for a ramble until the music stopped, which wasn't until late that night. Here we are on July the 24th, 1804. At sunset, we celebrated our country's 28th birthday by firing the cannon and giving the men an extra ration of whiskey. We still have not determined which of the men will become part of the permanent party and proceed west with us after we winter at the Mandan village. Some of the men have indispensable skills. Others we are watching carefully to see what they can add to, our, to help our efforts. And then here we are with Seaman's perspective. During the winter, I'd grown very attached to this tribe of men and now considered them my family. I knew their moods, their sense or lack of humor, their sleeping habits, which foods they enjoyed and the foods they could not abide. I knew which of them were the best marksmen and which, if separated from the tribe, would perish, perish for lack of skill. As we made our way upriver, my role within the tribe became clearer to me. I could not paddle or pull the boat cook meals, or play the fiddle. But I had other talents that were just as useful. I had, long dis I had discovered long ago that human beings have pitiful no noses. About all they can do is breathe through them, which is a shame and a great handicap in the wilderness. If the wind is blowing right, my nose can smell a deer two miles away and a skunk a considerable distance farther. I can tell the future with my nose and sometimes figure out what happened a day or two before if the scent is strong. Another almost useless appendage is the human ear. The man couldn't hear anything until it was right in front of them and sometimes not even then. My ears work in concert with my nose. I can conjure a pretty clear picture of what lies ahead 
long before I get to it or it gets to me. These skills came in pretty handy during our journey, although conveying what I knew without the use of words was a challenge at times. Every night, the captains posted sentries to forewarn us if we came under attack. This was not the men's favorite duty, but I didn't mind it, so whenever I could muster the energy, I spent my nights patrolling the camp. If I heard or scented something unusual aside from the men snoring and breaking wind, I'd low growl, and if that didn't rouse the men from their sleep, I would let out a series of deep barks. This got everyone swearing and stumbling around in a hurry, which was great fun, which was great fun to see, but I was careful not to use this alarm unless there was a good cause. A few nights before the men's big celebration, I'd learned that trouble didn't always come from outside the camp. That night, I saw Private Collins tap a whiskey barrel with the other man, tap a whiskey barrel after the other man had gone to sleep. He held his tin cup under the spigot two or three times, and after a while, he started to sing and sway. Pretty soon, he was joined by Private Hall, and it wasn't long before their singing woke Sergeant Ordway, who changed, who changed their tune. The next morning, the captains held a court-martial. All the men participated in these trials, passing judgment as a group after hearing the facts. In this case, the men were not inclined to forgive Collins and Hall, as the whiskey they drank belonged to everyone, and the two men's taking more than their share meant the others would get less. Guilty, the men shouted after he hearing Collins and Hall's side of the story. The punishment, 100 lashes for Private Collins and 50 for Private Hall, commenced immediately, starting with Collins. The lash was made out of strips of leather, and when applied to a man's bare back, it opened up long, bloody cuts, which took weeks to heal. Collins' shirt was removed, his arms tied around a tree, and he was whipped, with all the men counting each stroke out loud until they reached 100, which was a relief to all of them. Collins did not hear the final call as he had passed out on the 52nd lash. Two men untied him and took him down to the river to clean and dress his wounds. Hall was next. As soon as the punishment was completed, camp was broken and the boats were loaded. Privates Collins and Hall were expected to pull their oars on the keelboat as usual. Pretty tough punishment, right? Okay, July the 10th, 1804. This is from Captain Lewis's journal. If the number of furs we have seen coming down river is any ind indication, this country's bounty is endless. I am confident we will prevail and find the Northwest Passage. With the discovery of the passage, we will be able to move these trade goods easily from the Pacific to the Atlantic and beyond to other countries by ship, greatly increasing our nation's commerce. The scenery here is beautiful, but we are greatly afflicted by the heat and mosquitoes. The men are fatigued and several have boils on their skin. Private Joseph Fields was bitten by a rattlesnake a few days back. I treated the wound with a poultice of Peruvian bark. I think he will be fine. The snake was killed and I put the skin and rattle in my collection. Despite the afflictions, the men seem to be in good cheer. And then here's Seaman's perspective. The Missouri's current lowered and slowed a little more each day, which allowed us to increase our speed up the river. The men's muscles were as hard as rocks and their skill at handling the boats had increased a hundredfold since we left Wood River in May. On some days we made better than 25 miles. Despite this, the men were not always in good cheer, as Captain Lewis said. The French voyagers hired to take our two pirogues as far as the Mandan village were constantly complaining about the pace the captains had set and about the food. They were used to stopping several times a day to rest and eat. The captains rarely allowed any stops except to make camp at night. The other man complained too, but not as often, and not in the captain's presence. They were soldiers, and this was not allowed. I noticed that within our tribe were smaller tribes. This was mostly most easily seen by how the men clustered themselves at night. The captains usually slept in or near the keelboat. The French voyagers slept near the red and white pirogues. The three sergeants, Floyd, Ordward, Ordway, and Pryor, camped together near their men. The privates, Druilliard and Dorian, pretty much stayed together in a big group. And York, the tribe's only black man, 
put his bedroll within earshot of the captain's, although he sometimes visited the privates in the evenings after Captain Clark's needs had been tended to. York was a big man, kind to everyone, even those who were not kind to him. When treated unfairly, he responded with a smile rather than his fists. But I sometimes smelled fur fury beneath that easy smile of his. It rose to the surface every time a man made a negative comment about his color, but he had learned to hold that angry flame inside and quench it with the juice deep in his belly. The men claimed that York was Captain Clark's slave and that this meant Captain Clark owned him. At first, I did not believe them, but over the months, I saw that it was true. I had more freedom to do as I pleased than he did. As we got farther west, I saw slaves among the Indian tribes too. These poor Indian slaves, mostly women and children, were captured in raids and bartered back and forth like the cows I had seen in stockyards when I was with Brady. I wondered if Captain Clark had raided York's tribe and taken him away from his people. However it had happened, York never complained about it, and although he had ample opportunity, he never tried to escape. I moved freely among all these clusters of men, but there was one man I treaded lightly around. His name was Private Moses Reed. Some of the men called him a weasel, but to me that was an insult to the sleek beauty of the real animal. Moses Reed was slippery and mean-spirited, more like an eel than a weasel. He was constantly shirking his duties and saying bad things about the captains and sergeants when they were out of earshot. One day when no one was looking, he kicked me in the ribs as hard as he could and said, I'll be eating you one day soon, you dumb mongrel. Mark my words. There were other kicks and sometimes Reed would seek me out, step on my toes, then curse me in front of the other men. The mongrel is always underfoot. He's a hazard to the entire expedition. What kind of captain would bring a giant dog along with him? He'll get all the food and we'll starve. Mark my words. Everyone had learned to ignore Reed's brain, except for Private John Newman, who followed Reed around like York followed Captain Clark. At night, Reed and Newman slept a little off from the others so they could talk without anyone hearing them. One night, as I patrolled the camp, I heard them whispering, I've been thinking about Dorian and those other trappers we've seen coming down the river. Reed said, they must have, they must have had a thousand dollars worth of skins in their dugouts. A thousand dollars worth. One of them told me it took them only about two weeks to trap and trade for all them skins. He said the Indians have no idea what the furs are worth. You give them a couple of worthless beads and they hand over a pile of beaver skins worth a fortune. Imagine making a thousand dollars in two weeks. That's a lot of money, all right, Newman admitted. Instead of breaking our backs getting these boats upriver, we'd be out trapping just like them. In a year, we'd be rich. But we wouldn't get the land grant that the Army promised us for volunteering for the Corps. 400 acres is a lot of property. Yeah, if you want to be a farmer, Reed snorted. That's not for me, I tell you. Besides, we'll never see one acre of that land. What are you talking about? The land deal was just a carrot they put out in front of us, so we'd agree to go. Not true, Reed laughed. You're about as green as they come, Newman. I've been in this army a lot longer than you, and I know how it works. Mark my words. Newman thought about this for a few moments. If you knew they weren't going to give you the land, why did you volunteer? Free trip into the interior, Reed said. All paid for by the army. How else would I get a chance to see what's here? And now that I've seen it, I can tell you I'm not going to wait for two or three years to get at it. Desertion? I didn't say that, Reed whispered quickly and changed the subject. What about the girl you got waiting back home for you? What about her? Think she'll wait for two years for you to come back? I hope so. Said she would. Any other young man back home she might be interested in? Newman didn't answer. I thought so. How do you think she'd feel if you came back a lot sooner with your pouch filled with money? She'd be mighty happy, Newman said. At that moment, I wanted to drag Newman away from Reed and shake him like my mother used to do to me when I was about to get myself into trouble. I took a step toward them. What's that? Newman sat up suddenly. 
The captain's dog. I'll fix him. Reed picked up a rock and threw it at me. He missed. And here we are back in Lewis's journey journal. And uh, there's going to be a vocabulary word right off. The word is parlay. August the 1st, 1804. We came across an Odo Indian a few days ago. He told us that most of the Odos were out on the prairie hunting buffalo, but claimed some others were not far from here. We sent a man with the Indian to invite them to parlay with us. And I'll read that last sentence again. We sent a man with the Indian to invite them to parlay with us. So now you need to take a minute and try to figure out what the word parlay means. We continued to be plagued by various ailments. Last night, Captain Clark lanced a boil on one of the men and a pint of pus was taken from the wound. Private Whitehouse cut his knee with his knife and lost a great deal of blood, but we managed to stem the flow. Sergeant Floyd has had a bad cold for several days and some stomach problems, which I am treating. I have been virtually free of dark moods and my strength and health have been good as have Captain Clark's. He is 34 years old today. For his birthday dinner, he has requested a saddle of fat venison, roasted beaver tail, and elk steak, and for dessert, some of the berries growing so profusely around here. The men are clearly feeling the effects of their labors. We will rest here for a few days and wait for the Odos. We hope this will give the men a chance to recover their strength. And then here is Seaman's point of view. Captain Lewis calculated that each man was eating nine pounds of meat a day, and yet some of them were still going to sleep hungry. One night, Drewyard came back to camp with an elk. Private Reuben Field came in with two deer, and John Coulter brought in two beavers with fat tails. But this was barely enough food to feed the camp for one day. This dearth of meat did not affect me, because there were certain parts of the animals the men refused to eat. They threw out piles of perfectly good food, entrails mostly, that were more than enough to slake my appetite. But the meat I was really looking forward to getting my teeth into was the buffalo's an bu that buffalo animals. The men were constantly talking about this beast, but only a handful of them had actually seen one. Every time I heard the word buffalo, drool spilled out of my mouth. Ready to trample to the top of that bluff? Captain Clark asked. I am, Captain Lewis put his pen down and closed the red book. Let's go, see. I ran ahead of them. As I neared the top, I scented something unfamiliar. I stopped and tried to get a sense of what this new smell meant, but no picture came to mind. The captains caught up with me and we stepped through an opening in the brush. We were stunned by what we saw. I managed a low growl, but the captains were speechless for a moment or two. I hadn't seen an open area this big since I was a pup aboard a ship. Before us was an ocean of golden grass stre stretching as far as we could see. The wind moved the long grass back and forth across the endless flat prairie in long rolling waves. Prairie, Captain Clark said. I had no idea it was so. He couldn't seem to find the right word. Vast, Captain Lewis said. For several minutes, we just stood there staring at the stark, lonely beauty of it. All day long, we had fought the river, not knowing this lay just above us. We walked about a mile in, across the black, grassy plain to a small stand of trees. Caw! 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 A crow scolded us from the branch of one of the trees. I had seen hundreds of crows and ravens, but never one like this. On his left wing was a patch of feathers as white as a scrubbed mainsail. Caw! 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 The captains were so used to hearing crows, they didn't even bother to look up. I barked, trying to get their attention on the bird. If Captain Lewis saw it, he would certainly want to add it to his animal collection. He glanced up at the tree, then back across the prairie. I barked again. Quiet, see, Captain Lewis said. What's gotten into you? I guess he had seen crows with white feathers on their wings before and was not interested in collecting this one. He would not have been able to shoot it anyway because the next time I looked, the crow had vanished. On our way back across the prairie, I came across several new scents I was eager to investigate but they had to wait because Captain Clark wanted to get back to camp and see how the men were doing with his birthday feast. 
When we arrived, Private Joseph Fields ran up to us. He was carrying a brownish gray animal about the size of a cat. Joseph and his older brother Reuben were both good hunters. Because of his excitement, I wondered if the animal he was holding was one of the buffalo we were all so eager to see. But one sniff of its musky carcass told me it wasn't. I shot it near a stream that runs into the river up ahead, Joseph explained. It put up quite a ruckus, growling and carrying on. I had no idea what a rifle was. Didn't back off an inch when I pointed the it had no idea what a rifle was. Didn't back off an inch when I pointed the barrel at it. What do you think it is, Captain Lewis? I don't know. Captain Lewis laid the animal on the ground and examined it closely. One of the French boatmen came over. It's what we call a badger. The creature seemed to make Captain Lewis happy, which did not go unnoticed by the men. From that day on, all of them were on the lookout for new animals and plants to bring the captain. After Captain Lewis had eaten and participated in the birthday festivities, he quietly slipped away to the keelboat. In the dim lantern light, he measured, skinned, and tanned the badger, writing down notes like how many teeth it had in an official journal he and Captain Clark were keeping. He offered me some of the meat from the carcass, but I didn't like it. It tasted sour. He threw the meat into the river, but kept some of the badger bones and its skull. He then took the still wet skin and sewed it back together again, stuffing the body with cotton. I was to see him do this many times with different animals during the course of our journey, but I never understood the purpose. The results were much less satisfactory than the original animal had been. For two days, we stayed, in at, we stayed at this camp, which the captains named Council Bluff, in anticipation of the parley we were about to have with the Odos there. I used the time to take several rambles across the prairie to investigate the grass sea. My most interesting discovery was a small wild dog. I found the den where she had whelped, and a mile later I found her a sleek, buff-colored beauty with long pointed ears and a bushy tail, and her two young ones. She caught wind of me as I approached, and she and her pups disappeared into the, into the tall grass, which matched the color of their fur. I gave chase, but they were too quick, and I soon lost sight of them. I would not have done her any harm. I wish she had stayed around long enough to learn my intentions. And we're at the end of our reading for this time.